in, in terms of my process of fabricating and creating a show, um, there, there are lots of failures, uh, but they are always, uh, you know, springboards for the next level of, of creation, talking to people, reading, um, you know, the, and there's some marvelous people have gone before us, you know, pay attention to them. Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger and Cameron Garrity. And today's a special day. We have Bart Rockaburton on the show. Welcome to the show, Bart. Well, thank you. Well, so for those who don't know, Bart Rockaburton uh, is the head of the Puppetry Arts Program at the University of Connecticut. He is one of the founders of the National Puppetry Conference at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. Uh, before that, did all sorts of other work with the O'Neill in sort of showing the puppetry world to that incredible uh, theater center and has just been an incredible ambassador to the art of puppetry all over the world. We are so honored to have him here. Uh, Bart Rockaburton, welcome to Puppet Tears. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, so what are you up to right now? That's where we love to start. Uh, what, <laughs> what kind of projects are you working on? I'm sure you got a million balls in the air. Currently, we are working on um, auditions for tomorrow evening where we're going to be casting for five productions we're working on this year. Neta Itzadi, our Iranian MFA student, is working on a production that is dealing with women's issues in Iran, interwoven with Persian mythology. Abigail Bosley is working on a project that she's calling it Puppets Help Pets. She comes to us from the Philadelphia area as a mascot performer. And while she's been here, she's learned all different aspects of puppetry. And with her final project, she has decided to make mascot-style costumes as well as moving mouth puppets of the same characters. And she's connecting with kennels across the country to help them deal with issues of rescue pets and care for rescue pets. And she'll do this both as video YouTube uh, segments as well as live on-site performances at different kennels, uh, especially in Pennsylvania. Maggie Flanagan, she is working on a stop motion animation on um, a piece that she's calling The Unicorn and the Hound. Esme Roselle, our, grad, our, our senior student, is working on a piece based on letters that she had from her great uncle who, who um, was lost in World War I. And they're letters that were sent home to her, his mother shortly before his death. Our final project is something people might know called Little Shop of Horrors. And that's being uh, created by, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, Will Smith and um, uh, Rob Cutler are doing that as a combined MFA. Will is doing the design and fabrication of the puppet. And Rob is doing uh, the performance and also dramaturgy for the production. Now, this is part of our Connecticut Repertory Theater season. It'll go up in April. So we're already underway. We actually feel like we're behind on this. But the challenge for Will was, I don't want to see the Broadway puppet. I want you to come up with something different. And he has. It's really a remarkable design. Awesome. So that's what's on my mind today. Yeah, I can't I wait bet. to see that for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. And so what's the nature of the audition process? Is that other students who are not as far, far along in the program uh, who are coming up and helping out? Or, or what's the nature of those? Yeah, it's an all call for the puppet arts students uh, from our freshmen. We have four new freshmen this year who are delightful uh, right up through the undergraduate program through the graduate program. And we actually have four new uh, graduate students as well this year. So we have a new population. So the audition will be a, a movement section uh, where um, Abby and Netta and Rob and Esme will be watching the movement of the people all through the same process. Then we'll split them up and Abby will do some monitor work with her kids. Maggie will work with um, Dragon Frame and stop motion animation with some, uh, some mock-ups that she's created. Rob and Will will be watching for people who are strong and might be able to be a second for the uh, for Audrey too. So um, we'll put them through vocal exercises, movement exercises, and then very specific um, uh, project or elements related to each of the projects. That's so cool. Yeah, and that that just speaks so to puppetry in general, like that that super collaborative. Um, environment like in in other school programs you wouldn't necessarily think about 
um, people in a in a master's program, you know, calling on freshmen to help them out with a project, and that's that's something so so unique. I, I love that. Uh, it is actually, and we've got a couple of, a couple of our new freshmen have been in our workshops. We, uh, if we're working on a new piece, we always take two weeks in the very beginning of the year to workshop the piece to challenge it. You know, we have a script. What do we know how to do? We're not going to focus on that. What don't we know how to do? Let's challenge that. And we've had a couple of our freshmen come in and they're very vocal and very interested and yet they're just learning puppetry, but I'm very impressed. So um, you, you mentioned um, in, in the lead up to today, uh, you mentioned that there have been some other events happening at the, the Ballard Institute and some other things. Can you talk about that? We've had a very busy September. Uh, at this moment, um, uh, there's an exhibit, my own puppets, that has been up since um, since April, and it actually closes today. So tomorrow we start striking them. We had a farm last a week ago Thursday where we um, uh, where I was the focus of it, and the idea was um, John, John Bell, our, our director of the Ballard Institute, asked me what topic I would like to do, and I said, let's call it Building Puppeteers, where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. And I talked for almost two hours um, in a very condensed way of my own history and the history of the puppet arts program at the university. Then the next night, we had a puppet slam, and the next day, the Ballard Institute was involved in a pageant of um, of uh, pollinators. Uh, there's a focus uh, in the town at the moment on pollination. And so they built puppets out of cardboard boxes with the community and performed the pageant in the center of the town green. Then this week, uh, we have Alex and Olmsted. Uh, performing uh, both Friday night with their homebodies piece for adults, and then Milo the Magnificent was performed yesterday for um, for the general public. So it's it's been quite busy, and then we have classes on top of that. <laughs> People who follow my Facebook page probably know all about uh, Milo the Magnificent. It, it is, is like one of my favorite things yeah. in the world. I can't wait to have them on the podcast, too. I, I started off as a magician before I did puppetry, right. too. So it really is everything that I love in, in a show all in one. What was delightful to see was the talent of Alex and Olmsted as I saw them do another production. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not that they focused only in, into Milo. They have this expansive sure. oh, yes. possibility, and I was I was really blown away by their performance. Oh yeah, what artists they are! Yeah, they do. I, I always look at all their feed and stuff. They always are up to such cool things. Yeah. Oh, and Hobie Ford, Hobie Ford was here on Friday as well. And oh, okay. oh, cool. <laughs> Eric Bass, another person yeah. we're we're itching to have on the show. Yeah, yeah, too. yeah especially since his book just came out. Yeah, too. yeah. <laughs> Um, no, it, it was something really cool about um, about Alex was um, this year at the O'Neill, he wasn't able to make it. And um, I sent him, or I should say Valerie Meese sent him my notes from Krupa's class. Oh, good. And he built uh, in the same, over the same weekend, he was building along with us. And it's just such an incredible, like, technical mind and love, love working with him and, and love to see the stuff that he does. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. Um, well, would love to, you know, something that we do with a lot of our guests is just go back to sort of the beginning. And we'd, we'd love to hear how puppetry found you, but also what kind of kid were you before maybe that even happened? <laughs> <laughs> were you a kid? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, okay. Um, actually, I, I was I was a good kid, ask, ask my mom. And <laughs> I was a good student. Uh, had a lot of interests in uh, grammar school and high school. And uh, music was primary. I was uh, playing in rock bands. Um, I was asked to join my cousin's college rock band. And uh, we actually ended up uh, auditioning for a recording contract with a company called BT Puppy, which was a division of Columbia. Uh, it was actually overseen by the group The Tokens, who did The Lion Sleeps Tonight. And we made a number of demos and got a call from them saying, uh, sorry, guys, we just went bankrupt. And so that was the end of my professional music career. But music was still very much part of it. And uh, when I went to college, I was accepted at Drew University and went in as a music major. When they started teaching me music theory, I couldn't write music anymore because I felt that music notes had to relate to each other in certain ways and you had to pay attention to. And so the, I wasn't feeling the music. So in the next two years, I sort of explored my other interests, sincere interests. 
I was an English literature major, anthropology major, archaeology major, chemistry for about two weeks. And eventually I ended up in theater. And there I said, okay, I feel really good here because I can do historical research. I can do plays related to social issues. I'm going to be a theater major. Of course, at the time, Drew University didn't have a theater major. So I transferred to Montclair State in New Jersey. Went in thinking I was going to be a performer, but very quickly ended up in technical theater, where I was really excited. Had a teacher named uh, Chris Stashev, who was teaching us television broadcasting techniques. And he had mentioned puppets a few times. And in my senior spring year, uh, the spring semester of my senior year, I realized I was three credits short in my major. And so I went to Chris and said, you know, I need a three credit gut course to get out of here. Can I do something with puppets? And he said, yeah, yeah, do a Punch and Judy show for me. Make, make some hand puppets. He understood I was a good student and I needed the credits to, to uh, graduate. Well, I did my research and realized it wasn't the challenge I wanted. Hand puppets I could make overnight. I decided to do string puppets. Punch and Judy, eh, I ended up doing a small play by Bertolt Brecht. <laughs> and I, I, can, I can remember actually sitting in the hallway uh, working on the head before a class and the department head coming through and going, oh, making puppets, going to do a kid's show for us, huh? I looked up at him and I said, these puppets are for Brecht. Yes. <laughs> Very I, sophisticated I, kids. I, 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 had never, I didn't consider that puppets had to be for kids. And I can actually look to that moment as the moment that I became an advocate for, for the puppet arts, that this man didn't understand it. I needed to teach him something. So I did the piece, I enjoyed it, and then went off to a, a community college in New Jersey, Atlantic Community College near Atlantic City. While there, the department head, I think, had more interest in puppetry than I did and kept finding reasons I needed to build a puppet to help this show along. As I was looking at grad school, I was thinking of lighting design. And I had a friend at the University of Connecticut who was in the lighting program, and she said, you know, come on up, take a look. Well, I came up and I met Frank Ballard. Oh, puppets are here, huh? So my wife and I talked, and we decided I'd do the puppetry program, and if I didn't like it, I'd slide over to lighting. But when I got here, I realized that I was taking all the lighting classes as well as the puppetry classes and the acting classes and the directing classes. So I never really looked back. And I think a thing that um, was really important about that is that when I came in, there was a gentleman named Brad Williams who also came in at the same time. Brad had studied art. He had worked with Bert Hilstrom in a, uh, a retrospective of, of Burr's work in Holland, Michigan. And he was one of the most creative, inspirational people that I can, to, till today, I can't think of anybody who is as creative as Brad was. We put together the Pandemonium Puppet Company because at that time when we were studying at the University of Connecticut, we were basically doing Frank Ballard shows, which were great. You know, we learned a lot doing the shows. But, um, you know, my, my rod puppet class, I built a catapult for the golden cockerel. You know, I never touched a rod puppet in the class. So everything was focused on doing Frank's work. Brad and I were a little frustrated with that because we came here to learn how to be puppeteers. And how do you become a puppeteer by doing a show every two years? So we put together the Pandemonium Puppets to give us ourselves an opportunity to work with audiences. And while we were students, we started doing more and more shows, uh, school shows, college shows, company picnics. And slowly we formed the company that, um, that was our sustenance as we left school. That's incredible. Can you um, th 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 uh, talk about the kinds of puppet shows that you were, were doing about that? Like, was that sort of your way, if you weren't getting what you were expecting or wasn't uh, uh, nourishing enough of what you were getting it uh, with, with Frank Ballard, was that was creating pandemonium really your way of d experimenting and, and trying new things and, and sort of self-teaching? Yes. Um, initially, uh, we we pulled together puppets that I had built and Brad had built before we came to Yukon. And because they were of such different styles, we decided to do short stories, vignette, a vignette show. 
they work together that way. And we had a ball doing it. We had, our first performance was actually on July 4th in 1976. It was a bicentennial moment, we always say. <laughs> and um, we just kept working from there and developing more and more. And we stayed with the vignette since um, as we created new shows. One, one show was Pantomime, we called it, which was um, oh, Brad, Brad had an ability with poetry. I, I should have the thing in front of me, but a, a pleasant plum pudding of with the alliter alliteration of peas throughout a whole paragraph. <laughs> and so it was uh, actually medieval stories. We did uh, St. George and the Dragon and um, uh, Carol Carolan, the Knights. Uh, but then we went into um, uh, Elven Tide, which was a, a show based on elf and fairy lore. Again, music has always been part of my work. Uh, Elven Tide, I wanted to do because I love British and Irish folk music and had lots of songs that I wanted to use and sing, and we found stories that went with them. Later, as uh, the company changed a little bit, we did a show called Fabula, based on uh, fables from around the world. And um, at that time, uh, Steve Tillis from the West Coast and uh, Carol Wolf were both working with me. And eventually, uh, our last on the road show was Tales of the Leatherman. And the Leather Man's a Connecticut character. He was a man who actually existed and wandered uh, some 20 to 30 miles every day on a very regular path, dressed in leather from head to toe, never spoke to anybody, but would go up to a house and knock on the door and point to his mouth and the people would feed him. Uh, as we started doing this show and people started coming up, uh, one elderly woman came to us and said, the leather man ate at my grandmother's house and he came back. That meant she was a good cook. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we use this as sort of bookends to tell New England folk stories. Uh, well, actually, actually, I'd say mid-Atlantic and New England folk stories. We found stories that worked uh, throughout the region because we toured basically from Maine down through New Jersey. It was a, a, a great experience, but as we were doing that, uh, that's when Margot Rose called me and asked me if I would help her set up a program at the O'Neill Center. Wow. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Um, but certainly, you don't want to move away from, from that moment of, of meeting Margot and, and being asked to come down uh, to Connecticut. But I would love to ask, uh, obviously, you mentioned you had a background um, in music and an interest in that. What was it about puppetry in, in that early time that you realized married so well with the music? I think um, music is a language of the puppet, you know, yeah. be, be it a verbal song or an instrumental song. Um, it, it's a way that puppets express themselves in a beautiful way. You know, since, since that time, um, I've actually spent five years of my career with the music of Igor Stravinsky. Uh, my MFA project was Least to Do Soldat. I've done Reynard the Fox. Uh, we did Oedipus, uh, Stravinsky's Oedipus, and a few years ago, I was invited by uh, some of our Taiwanese alumni to direct a production of Firebird with the National Symphony of Taiwan. Like That's how. amazing. Yeah, and do you think, I'm trying to figure out how I want to ask this, but um, is there something, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Mm -hmm. Is there something about, uh, I'm, I'm, very interested. One of my favorite um, painters growing up was uh, Vasily Kandinsky, and I loved his approach because of the synesthetic experience that he tried to create of really marrying the visual art with the music. He was obsessed with with orchestra and such. I, I would imagine that that's maybe something of a draw to you of marrying this, the, the visuals that the puppets are able to bring with the sound of the orchestra, the music, or, or whatever. Can you talk about selecting the kind of either puppet design or puppet movement and making sure that that really connected with the kind of music that was being played? Sure. Well, you're, you're mentioning of Kandinsky. Um, uh, the Bauhaus is a very important element in my background. Um, I'm, mm. I, when I discovered this, I, I was in college. Uh, the Bauhaus is uh, ex expressive potentials. Um, I'm a, a, a major um, fan, wrong word, but uh, uh, Oscar Schlemmer and his work with the Tri-Disha Ballet and uh, you know, dance and art and sculpture. 
it still blows me away. Uh, I've, I've been to Stuttgart and uh, have seen the actual Triadisha costumes in the museum, which are oh giving goosebumps. But, um, you know, Paul Clay also was of that same group. And um, over the years, we've done pieces uh, based on his art to the point where um, Larry Hunt, uh, the masked performer who also was a, a puppet art student, um, we mounted a production in Hong Kong based on Clay's paintings uh, and we called it playing with clay which is a really clever name in english but in um cantonese it goes <laughs> you know <laughs> um i'm sorry I, I i went away from your question cam uh, could you say it again what was your interest in or or how did you in that early stage um note or or what was your interest in marrying the visual elements of the the puppet and whatever they were, whatever motion they were doing with any kind of style of, of music. Cause d d making the choice to marry those two things must have been its own creative endeavor of, of solving your creative, um, solving the creative, uh, so, uh, equation you set up for yourself. Sure. Um, you know, each piece brings up its own, um, its own inquiry, if you will, um, for my MFA, project, I did two pieces, uh, L'Histoire du Soldat and uh, La Creation du Monde by Darius Miho. They were both diametrically different. With L'Histoire du Soldat, I think I actually chose it because we had had Dick Myers uh, come in and Albrecht Roser as guest artists uh, while I was a student. And I wanted to prove to the university that their time here was valuable. So I designed the characters in L'Histoire using Albrecht's paper sculpture technique that I still teach. And in terms of the puppets, I used um, Dick Meyer's idea of uh, rod puppetry and had puppets that were full body on the stage and moving legs and arms, uh, you know, a, a la Dick Meyer's, not, not in the same style, but mechanically uh, inspired by him. Listro du Soldat, I had wanted to explore uh, black theater, you know, Curtain of Light theater, and so uh, La Creation is an African creation myth, is the idea of it. Uh, it actually, when it was first first uh, performed in the early 1900s, they had the idea of Adam and Eve dancing and then animals appearing, and they made balloons out of leather to represent the animals and filled them with helium. And the sound of the helium going into the balloons was so loud they couldn't hear the orchestra. So oh, wow. I said, okay, you know, but at the time I'd seen several African creation myths and this new thing just was talked about in the late uh, 1970s, this thing called the Big Bang Theory. And so I actually did a piece based on the Big Bang Theory of the creation of the universe, starting with the primal atom, with, which is the mass of everything exploding and ending up uh, settling in with the last several bars of the music to a landscape with water, sky sun and the last thing to see was a flower growing so it was all done in black theater style okay um from there other things uh we've done peter and the wolf um recent well two years three years ago <laughs> um, i know you've, you've you've spoken with sarah nolan uh she was a student in the puppet arts program and uh, the Boston Pops comes to campus every Christmas to perform a Christmas concert. And every year they have some dignitary at the university read the night before Christmas while they play the music. I got a call asking if I would read it. And I said, no. And he went, well, I said, we'll do it, but I'm not going to read it. And it happened that that year Sarah had created uh, a character for... Um, uh, for the university's uh, publicity side, uh, a character named Skip Timalu. And we decided to have Skip Timalu do the reading. We put her into a big present on the stage, and um, Keith Lockhart, the conductor of the, the Pops, said, is Skip Timalu here? And the, the present rattled, and Sarah popped up out of the top, and Austin Costello was helping her. And they did the reading. And afterwards, Keith came to me and said, you know, Bart, I have done that piece probably a hundred times every season for the past 20 years. That was the most fun I had. Can we do something together? Here's the Boston Pops asking if we can work with them. And it was like, um, sure. And we ended up putting together a piece that we performed in Symphony Hall in Boston with them. 
uh, we took some of the music uh, that they owned and uh, created six different pieces, plus our Peter and the Wolf. And anytime we did Peter and the Wolf, uh, we always asked for a local celebrity to be the narrator. You know, radio, television, well, here we are in Boston. There's Every other person is a celebrity. So who can we choose? And I finally asked the pops, you know, would you mind if we made a puppet of Arthur Fiedler? And they said, well, we need to talk to his son. So they spoke with his son, and his son said, sure, do it. So I designed the puppet, and then Sarah Nolan uh, fabricated it, and Sarah added a lot of her talent into it. So I now say that Sarah and I designed the puppet. Caleb Martinez performed it, and we had Caleb study Arthur Fiedler's uh, speech, which was not a Bostonian accent. It was an affected English accent with German hints to it. We had Arthur Fiedler narrate Peter and the Wolf. Oh. After our first performance, the pop staff came to me and said, would you be able to have Arthur Fiedler conduct Stars and Stripes forever for us in the next concert? And during our rehearsal process, I kept saying to the students, you know, you really have to learn how to read music. It's really important that you can understand this. I know, I know you do counting. I know you do listening. But I'm the one who's sitting here reading this saying, go, go, go. So when they asked us to do this, I turned to the students and said, you know how I've been saying you have to read music? I get to do this. So I was able to conduct the Boston Pops in Stars and Stripes forever. And what was sort of fun about it was that one of the pieces we had done was based on Make Way for Ducklings, the story about the ducks trying to cross the street. So we had a mama duck and a little duck, uh, you know, six little ducks. So when they got to the section of the music, da 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 we had mama duck come in and the little duck. And of course, uh, most people are aware the you know, be kind to your web-footed friends. That worked well. And the piccolo section in Stars and Stripes sounded very much to me like the flute in Peter and the Wolf. So we had the bird come back in and fly around while the piccolos were playing. We had a ball. So, you know, every, every piece that I've worked with uh, has been a different style. Uh, the Firebird in Taiwan, um, I was working with the leading children's book illustrator in Ch Taiwan as my designer. And she had seen my paper sculpture puppets and said she wanted to do them that way. So I was over there early for research in November, and I sat her down for a couple of days and said, this is the way we do it. And she was going, ah. And when I got back in January, she had drawn everything that she wanted. I said to her, you know, that's not the way we approach paper sculpture. We start with the paper and we find the shape in it. Uh, let me take one of your designs, see if I can do it. And within 10 minutes, I folded out exactly what she had drawn. I said, okay, let's go. So the entire show was uh, done in paper sculpture that she designed. And um, it was a full stage production. The stage was the size of the Metropolitan Opera House. I, at first, when I looked at it, I said, oh my God, we're never going to fit. You know, we're, we're too, we'll never fill this. But by the time we got there, three months later, uh, the stage was actually a little too small for what we planned. So we had to cut back on some things. Wow. Can you um, just describe the paper sculpture process? Uh, because I, I think maybe the, for some of our, our listeners, it's the first time they're hearing about it. Oh, sure. Um, this is a process uh, or a, a, a method of sculpting that was developed by Albrecht Roser, uh, the German marionettist from Stuttgart. And it starts with um, the shapes of cones and cylinders. The idea is to find a head or hand or body it, with the shapes of the cones and cylinders. You make cuts, you make other cones. Um, the basic idea is that you do your sculpture and when you're done, you cut it apart. You have a flat pattern that you can then realize in another material, be it um, a hardened, hardened material or um, foam. Uh, it has lots of possibilities. And the bottom line for it when I teach it to the students is that you need to learn to teach yourself how to see the shapes of cones and cylinders in your own surrounding. You know, our eyes are a, a concave cone, but the eyeball itself is a convex cone. So you need to think that way. Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a great approach. And I, it, it reminds me of when I was in painting classes, we'd have a teacher who would say, look up at the sky 
and don't tell me that that sky is just blue and white. It's not just blue sky and white clouds. Yes. Um, and it's, it's you know, a much richer approach to color, and you, you kind of have that same approach to shape. I love that. Yeah, well, and, and you know, the puppet art students also hear the same idea about, you know, go out and look at the bark of a tree. What are, what, what are the myriad colors that you're seeing in that four-inch section of bark? So when you um, you started to mention um, getting connected with Margot Rose and, and the O'Neill Center, her asking you to come down, was that your first experience in, in meeting Margot? No, actually, um, I met Margot in 76 when the National Puppete- uh, Puppeteers of America Festival was held at Conn College, which is in New London. And Margot was the... Um, the, the host hostess of the event, uh, Frank Ballard and Mike Oz were the artistic directors. So um, I was asked to be technical director of the festival by Frank. And in so doing, I uh, met Margot. Uh, she lent me some of their equipment. I remember her giving me their, their um, Snow White and Three of the Seven Dwarves stage. And I asked her for directions and she said, you'll figure it out. And my goodness, it, it was like Rufus was standing next to me. I unfolded this thing and looked and said, oh, that comes here. And because that comes here, this comes here. It was, it was amazing. So she and I got along very well at that time. And uh, the reason Margot asked me to try and help, um, help her with the O'Neill Center was that the program at the University of Connecticut was always in jeopardy. Frank had founded it in 1965 when uh, the graduate school was looking for new topics to offer. It happened that Mel Helstein at UCLA had started an MFA program in puppetry based on the training at Damu in Prague. Frank said, okay, here's my opportunity too. So he created his MFA proposal. And thankfully uh, it went directly to the grad school uh, because um, Frank's department head was on sabbatic leave. If he had not been on sabbatic leave, it would never have left his desk because the man hated puppets. So we we had this tunnel that worked for us. But um, the university constantly questioned why there was a puppetry program at the university. And any time there was a budget cut, it would be the first thing on the cutting board. But then they'd say, well, you know, we did just get this international press about it. And we're not spending anything on it anyway. Well, okay, keep going. The real key here was that Frank had Parkinson's. And it was a known quantity that he would have to retire at some point. So myself, Brad Williams, Margot Rose, Albert Roser, Jim Henson, were all asking the university, what is the future of the program? They wouldn't respond. So Margot had the idea that um, because the Theater of the Deaf, which had been founded at the O'Neill Center, had just received an endowment and had left the O'Neill grounds, she wanted to ask George White, the founder, if a puppetry program could fill its place. So she called me and asked me if I would help. And um, maybe, um, you know, I met her in 76, but um, I had also been in charge of Albert Roser's residency in 77 so she knew i had some abilities um probably she she probably knew more than i did and so i helped her put together proof as to why a program should exist at the o'neill center and she made the appointment with george white we walked in me carrying a stack of folders as proof as to why we should exist margo said george we feel it's time to start a puppetry program here at the o'neill center and that, well, batting an eye, George said, I agree. What's the budget? And the two of us are sitting there with all these papers going, but, 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 budget? You know, we, we hadn't thought about what it would cost. So It's like picking up a can of soda that you think is filled with, with, with drink, and you pick it up, and it's like, oh, that was yeah. way easier than I thought it'd be. Yeah. 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 So um, George, George had grown up in Waterford. He had played at the Rose's house. He knew what puppets were. He knew the potential for it. Plus, Margot and Rufus had helped start the O'Neill Theater Center when George had the idea to do it. Uh, Margot had stories of shoveling out the manure in the stalls so the first show could take place. So, uh, you know, she was very she was very respected there. So we started well, and her, her, I'm sorry, and her name graces the barn, her and Rufus yes. um, for the for the anyone who doesn't know. Right. But I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no problem. Um, it was decided that we would have a meeting with people we respect to talk about what we should do, if we should do it. And at this meeting, uh, Bill Baird was there, Peter Baird, Frank Ballard, 
um, uh, Allie Lou Curtin, Nancy Staub representing Henson. And um, I was on the phone every half hour to Vince Anthony in Atlanta just to keep him up to speed. And it was decided that we would start a program. Uh, it would be called the Institute of Professional Puppetry Arts. It would be intended to have an MFA program and then uh, also an undergraduate single semester program. As things were being talked about, uh, Bill asked at one point, so who's going to direct this program? And Marco says, Bart is. And I'm going, uh, do you want milk with your coffee? Yeah. <laughs> so my wife Marge and I talked and said, you know, um, Margo feels that I have the possibility here and we respect her so much, I should try. And so I um, found somebody to take my place in Pandemonium Puppets and started working at the O'Neill Center. And uh, we, we created a program that was, um, it was a two year long MFA program uh, accredited through Connecticut College. It was very successful. Uh, we, we also started uh, a one semester introductory program. We only offered that once and the only student who went through it was a fellow named Rick Lyon. And I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah a few people know. <laughs> yeah. He's doing okay. Yeah. I think so. And I think it's it's Rick's talents that got him there, not the fact that he came to the O'Neill Center with us. <laughs> Take a little credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also started programs for, for um, professionals. We had professional weekends where we invited guest artists in to work and just give people a chance to, you know, light the fires again. We did a program for the community uh, that we called uh, the Puppet Experiment, which was similar to the Experimental Puppet Theater of the Center for Puppetry Arts. And um, eventually we started a performance series. And it was actually the performance series that kept us running. Um, with the performance series, uh, we would invite a company in to do two family shows during the day. And if they had an adult show, we would have them do it at night, or we'd find a companion piece that would do an, be an adult show. And it ended up where um, local banks were calling us and saying, hey, can we put our name on that? You know, so we actually received the money that we were keeping the training program running with through doing the performance series. Right. Um, eventually, though, uh, here we are setting up an arts program during the Reagan era. First, he uh, cuts back on your ability to donate to the arts and have a tax credit, saying the, the corporations will be the Medici's. Then the next year, he says, corporations can't take cre tax credit for giving to the arts. And so we started collapsing financially. As we collapsed, I still had several students uh, that we were seeing through. Um, Vafa Kusus from Jordan, uh, Halak Yuchi from Turkey, and uh, Noelia, Orti uh, Noelia Ortiz Cortez from Puerto Rico. We did finish them. They all earned their MFA degrees. But I was working um, for no income at that moment. <laughs> But uh, Jane, Jane Hansen was on my board and she, as we collapsed, she said, you know, we need to have a meeting to talk about this. So we did have the meeting and, you know, she pointed out the fact that we proved the, the value of having puppetry at the O'Neill Center. We had direct contact with, um, with the National Playwrights Conference, the Critics Institute, the Music Theater Inst uh, Institute, which went on to produce or to create Avenue Q. The National Theater Institute, you know, they were all there and we had, we were, we were, we were on the same level with them. It was then that we decided to try uh, this one week to 10 day event uh, called the National Puppetry Conference. And we celebrated our 29th year this year, didn't we? Yes. So it, was, it worked. <laughs> Definitely. Well, and at that same time that you were um, sort of founding the the, the O'Neill Puppetry Conference, uh, weren't you also then taking over for Frank at the <laughs> at at UConn? Yes, uh, but that that in itself has a past. Um, Frank retired in '89, and I knew they were going to do a search for some. No, he he retired in '89, and they closed the program. Just okay, it's done. There was protest uh, by the students. They protested at the dean's office, the university president's office, the governor's office in Hartford, state cap state capital. Um, because I was uh, no longer being paid by the O'Neill, 
I had some time on my hands. And so I, um, I, while we ran IPA, I had made a lot of international contacts. So I wrote to them and said, could you please write a letter to the dean, to the president, to the governor? So we had a letter, camp, letter writing campaign go as well. They eventually decided that they would try to keep the program going and that they would do a search. My experience here as a student was not great. Um, I mean, I met Brad Williams and Richard Termini and Jan Rosenthal and they were uh, Rachel Prescott, Jolene Gates. They were all very valuable to me. But my experience here was not a good one. The department was not a good department at the time. A lot of infighting. Nobody was supporting puppetry. And so um, I really didn't have an interest in coming back to Yukon and I did not apply. But I got a call from the search committee saying, we'd like to set an appointment for your interview. I said, uh, why? I didn't apply. And they looked down the sheet and they said, oh, uh, uh, Kay Janney sent your, your, your bio in. Kay was teaching at uh, the Groton branch of, of UConn, uh, which is right across the Thames River from the O'Neill Center. And she and I had worked together a bit. So I called her. I said, "Okay, how dare you do that? You know, you know how I feel about Yukon. She said, okay. What is the O'Neill paying you right now? I went, well, nothing. Okay, so you go for the interview. It doesn't mean you get the job. If they offer you the job, you don't have to take it. If you do take it and you don't like it after a year, you leave. And what is the O'Neill paying you right now? <laughs> so I went in for the interview. I found that it was a very different department faculty uh, than when I was a student there in 10 years, it had transformed, it was, it was professionals uh, still working and collaborating in a very creative way within the department. And the, the biggest reason that I decided to stay was the students. I, I love working with students. That's incredible. So I, I, you obviously benefited from the fact that uh, the, the institution, the, the, the department had, had changed a bit, but when you got into that position, what were some of the conscious changes that you decided to make in making the, the, the program your own, but also taking it from a different experience that than you had when, sure. when Frank Ballard was in charge? Sure. Well, um, it, this actually, uh, the philosophy started forming when I, was, when I created the, the Institute of Professional Puppetry Arts. Uh, one of the first things I did when Margo said, Mark's going to direct it, uh, was to call alumni of the UConn program and say what worked, what didn't work. Mm -hmm. And virtually everyone that I spoke to said, you know, I learned a lot working on Frank's shows, but I never figured out what my own voice was. And so I realized, you know, IPA was not about me. It was about helping the students to find who they are and help them find their own expression. So that was very much the focus there. And that came back with me to the UConn. Uh, as, as I was offered the job, they said, and we expect you to do major shows every two years. I said, I'm sorry, no. And well, you have to. I said, no, no, no. It's about the students. You know, we'll do shows every year. We'll do three or four shows every year. But it's going to be primarily student-based. So in my now 29 plus years at UConn, I have only done two, uh, two main, main stage productions. Um, everything else that we've done, which is now in, in the hundreds, uh, has been student projects, student productions. Yeah. Well, and that's just so important because it allows, it, it gives the, the opportunity for the students to fail and risk and to make sure that they're they're learning through the process and they have more ownership than if it was just help me Bart, Bart Rockabert in, in doing another thing. Sure. And, you know, um, I say to them in the classes, um, look around you, you know, your 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 first uh, circle of uh, helpers is right here. Um, who paints better than you? Who performs better than you? Uh, who do you enjoy working with? And slowly, as this network uh, develops, they come to understand that they have to work cl uh, collaboratively and they hire each other. Uh, plus, we now have more than 50 years of alumni out there who are hiring them. So um, 
it's, it's working. I'm, I'm very pleased with what I'm seeing. Do you encourage them to work on bigger projects together or to work on more independent projects? Or is it kind of up to them? Because in a way, I, I, obviously there's benefits to both of them learning to work collaboratively. But however, especially as puppeteers, I think it's also important to learn how to work independently because sometimes that's all you can rely on is, is yourself. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it's the whole spectrum, Adam. We have conversations, you know, we're part of uh, the Department of Dramatic Arts. Our production wing is Connecticut Repertory Theater, which is an equity stage. And so there are lots of opportunities. We have scene designers, lighting designers, costume designers, projection designers. We have a, a school of digital media now that we can turn to. So there's lots of resources available to the students. But the question comes down frequently to, do you want to do the last show of your student career and perform it 10 times and then we'll fold it up and that's it? Or do you wanna create the first production of your professional career? And when we finish doing it, you're out on the road booking it. So it, it's a big question because some of the students say, you know, I'm never gonna have a chance to work with lighting designers and set designers again. I wanna take that opportunity. So it, it varies a lot, a lot of variation. Yeah, because that's one thing. I, I and, and some people I talk to that are that ask me for advice or email me, they say like, "Oh, I want to do this, but like I, I don't have this piece," you know. And I, I just try to encourage them to just like work with what you start working with what you have first, yeah. you know, and then and maybe other, if, if people enjoy your work, maybe they'll want to become a part of it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, even those who, who go off and, and create their own own expression, uh, they still have that network they, that they fall back on. Uh, yeah. So, that, you know, the, um, uh, they'll, they'll hire each other to, to, to join them and then move on on their own. Now, um, we we uh, both know and we've had plenty of, of UConn alums come on our show. Um, can you describe... A little bit of because it's it's such a robust network. I mean, it's and some of our closest friends are are part of that. Um, can you describe what certain qualities are in the kind of puppeteers, both that you're looking for when they come into the program, but also qualities that you think that they have as they graduate that are unique to a UConn experience? Sure. When I audition people for the program, I'm looking for creativity. All right. Um, our grad program is a really good example of this. We currently have uh, someone who comes in from English literature, right? She has dabbled in puppetry, but puppetry is not her mainstay. Her ability with English literature is her mainstay, and she's extremely creative. We accepted her, and now we're teaching her puppetry. Um, we have had people come in from, with backgrounds in clowning, in dance, in performance, of course. Uh, sometimes we get people with backgrounds in puppetry, but it's not, not as consistent as you might imagine. So creativity is what I'm looking for and passion. I want somebody who's hungry and willing to work hard because as you're aware, if, if you're in this field, if you're not the strictest boss that you've ever encountered, you're not going to go anywhere. So um, that's what I'm looking for. In terms of what they leave with, um, granted, they all leave different, differently, but the classes, uh, as I came into the program, I was the only one running uh, or teaching puppetry, but I did turn to the other professors in dramatic arts and say, you know, you're teaching them lighting and you're teaching it to puppeteers. You need to think about how to make that work for them. I said, so I'm not the only puppetry teacher, you are too. And that has worked. Uh, we, we have voice classes that are oriented towards puppetry now. Um, the classes that I taught, because I was the only professor, uh, first, uh, I mean, big difference between IPA and UConn. At IPA, the students were on call for three, three and a half hour classes every day, seven days a week. Within that, we would design clear time. Because our teachers were coming in from the outside, they were adjuncts. Um, you know, Roman Posca might be coming in to teach a history class, but he missed the train. So I go to the students and say, you have tonight off, you're here tomorrow morning. Uh, it became known as Rockabert and Standard Time. And um, <laughs> so here they are on call for 70 plus hours of class a week. I get to UConn 
and I have three classes that meet for two and a half hours each. I spent so much time trying to figure out what I could leave out. So frequently in a class, the students are going to hear me say, this is a doorway you need to know exists. We don't have time to go down that hallway, but you need to come back and explore it. But in the classes, I decided to make the classes consummate. Um, in the mask class, which is about learning how to use this tool for performance expression, we still need those things we put on our face. So in the performance class, we're doing face casting. We're building five masks. In paper sculpture, where you're learning how to work with a, a, a style of sculpture, a puppet's not a puppet till it moves. So midterm and finals are puppet performances for a sculpture class. So within all the classes, they're gaining little pieces of information that makes them, I, I believe, um, someone who can leave us and have the ability to say, I can do that. Oh, you need this? Yes, I can do that. Oh, I've only done a little of that, but I know where to start. So they have a lot of tools to work with. Nobody leaves us a professional. They have a toolkit that is valuable, and what they need to do is go get experience. Yeah, for the degree, it is, it is a performance degree, right? And, and um, I don't know how much of that is your choice as being in charge of it. Like, Because I, I see it more as a fine arts degree. Is, is there any thought to how that came to be one way or the other? There, I, there's no wrong answer, but it's just interesting right. how it ended up as, uh, as, as, as that one. Well, um, Frank actually set up the program as a design tech program. So when I was a student, uh, we weren't voicing the puppets. He would have actors voicing the puppets. And um, I've changed that radically. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wouldn't lean it towards performance or design tech. Um, I would say it's a puppetry degree. Yeah. Sure. Properly defined. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the one other thing I did as I came in, uh, besides making a focus on the student's expression, um, I made a very simple change that has actually had a very positive effect for us. Um, Frank established the puppetry program. I started referring to it as the puppet arts program. And it made people have to stop and think about what they were about to say and why is he calling it puppet arts? And it has been very valuable to us. Can you describe in your own words what that change meant and, and what the difference between puppetry and puppetry arts are. I'm, I'm sure people can infer what that what that difference is, but can you can you explain um, why you did that? Yeah. Um, and it, not puppetry arts, puppet arts. Oh, I, I apologize. Okay. Puppet arts. Yes. And uh, it, it came about thinking about I, I'm in the dramatic arts department, and that refers to the fact that we are acting, we are designing, we are fabricating, um, we're dancing. We're learning movement, we're learning dance. It has many components, and we accept that by calling it a dramatic arts department. By calling it a puppet arts program, people have the opportunity, if they want to take it, to say, oh, they're doing sculpture and painting and movement and voice and dance. So instead of just puppetry, which is this, <laughs> It's something that has components that add together into something larger. That's great. Um, did you face much resistance to that change, or were there people who like didn't understand why, like why that change was happening? I just, con I just constantly used it. Yeah, just change the syllabus. You mm -hmm. had, you had the final, you had the file, and just printed it. Right, right. right. <laughs> so, well, it, it, it was, you know, this is this is what it is. And anytime you talk to me, I'm the director of the puppet arts program. Yes, I do puppetry. That's part of my job. But um, you know, come on over and see who we are and what we do, and you'll you'll get a better sense. Yeah, yeah. And we talked about you know, as, as I'm a teacher as well, and you know, Cam has taught classes. And one thing about uh, you know, working with students is always you're trying to. Um, uh, you know, help the support 
what they already do as well as um, getting them to expand their knowledge, you know. So I imagine, so for, you said people come in with all different backgrounds, but some people do come in with specific puppetry backgrounds, and I'm sure you, a big part of what you try to do is to expand their puppet knowledge. So if someone comes in maybe uh, just with a, like a lot of Muppet influence, you know, you want to, of course, expand them to other st- uh, types of puppetry. And then, but but on the other hand, let's say someone comes in who's a, a, a expertise in uh, marionette and marionettes. You might say, you know, you're fine right where you are. We we need more marionette people in the world. Yeah, um, yes, um, especially at the undergraduate level, we get the the people who are um, the Muppet oriented, and as they do their audition uh, for for the program, I do talk to them about the fact that uh, there is only half of one class that I teach where we focus upon Muppet performance. It's the puppetry and television class, and we get we do monitor work and we get them up to speed on that. But the other half of the class is working with the TV uh, as a tool in a different way. So, um, you know, they, they understand that coming in. Uh, we have had people coming in who have strong marionette experience and we talk to them about the fact that they're also going to be doing rod puppets and hand puppets and shadows. And most often it's, Oh boy, you know, <laughs> yeah. this too. Uh, so, um, but I will say, um, there have been people who have applied for the program who have been working out there themselves and um, after talking with them and seeing what they did, I've actually said to them, you're welcome to come if you need the degree. But the fact is, you don't need the knowledge. You're, you, you're, you're doing well. And I, I don't want to ruin you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll let those individuals identify who they are. But there's several of them out there that I've had that conversation. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, because you don't think of that. And and in a way, it's the opposite of what you would expect someone uh, to do who's, you'd think, trying to recruit, uh, you know, people who are good to help make the college look good in a way. But, yeah, what a a nice uh, compliment that is to them, to to, uh, your acknowledging them as an as an artist yeah pl- please don't tell the university i do that though <laughs> <laughs> they're not watching <laughs> well and, and and to that point you also must see some really talented puppeteers who are just focused on that one thing and they don't have any interest in, in mm. expanding and you have that meeting saying like oh this is only one half of one uh one class or whatever and they say okay then th- that's that's great i'm gonna go elsewhere um i'll just go to her or i'll just do whatever yeah. um, and i'd yeah. argue you know bart expertise is being able to to because because everyone's an individual noticing you know like for this person that they do need to focus on only that yeah whereas this person what they're doing and what they want to focus on could be even stronger yeah. if we expanded their puppetry knowledge. Yes. So I'm sure that's a big part of what you do when, when you're accepting people. Yep. And, you know, when, when people audition for us, when they, when they come to audition, and we, we also have the ability to do a video audition. Um, you know, many of our students come in from overseas or from the other side of the country, and they just can't get here for the audition. Uh, back in the mid-'90s, I worked out a video audition that works absolutely perfectly. You know, many of the students who come into the program come that way, and... I don't think I've ever had one that I said, oh, that was a failure. Um, But they receive a statement from me which says, this is just one path to becoming a puppeteer. Okay. There are many other possibilities. Uh, You have, you know, I I guess I started by saying before any decisions are made, um, please know that there's only one path and it's the latest path. You can apprentice, you can learn on your own, you can study. uh, if if for some reason we can't accept you this year, it might be because of population. Come back next year and audition again. So um, I want people, and I think I uh, I actually end up the, the statement by saying puppetry is a small field. And if you are determined to become a puppeteer, I know that we're going to work together again. No, that that's so true. And um, yeah, you, you do see people, and this is, is true for other like smaller niche, um, you know, art, art, performance types and such but it's really about you know 90 percent of it is just about your motivation and and keeping at it versus any level of talent or or natural charisma or or anything like that it's just it's about doing the work something that i wanted to um talk to you about because um you know there's there's something to someone being able to to teach puppetry and especially puppet history elements um but 
the the students who go through UConn and and your ability to 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 teach and and share this, so much of it comes from you living through your own experiences and and knowing Margot and knowing uh, Allie Lou Curtin and knowing Jim and uh, Jane Henson. Can you just talk about the importance of or or how you feel you've benefited from really living in the world of puppetry and how that's made you a, a better educator? Yes. Um, I have always been open to the influence of people who've gone before me. Okay, so I did spend five years studying under Frank Ballard. And through him, I had the opportunity to meet um, many artists who then became personal friends, uh, Mar Margot being one uh, example. Um, Albert Roser from Germany is and is is also one of my mentors, and uh, his partner Ingrid Heffer has guided me. With the work that I did at UConn, and then the work I did at the O'Neill Center, I had the opportunity to um, to be with Jim Henson in a way that other people weren't really with him. Um, I mean, I was I was in the large cast for um, Muppets Take Manhattan when the, when the frog and the pig got married. But that was the only Muppet work I've ever done. However, Jim would spend time on the phone with me asking questions. Um, he came up to the O'Neill Center for us. He supported us. Uh, I had applied when we were doing the O'Neill Center for a, uh, a, a Henson grant. And Jim or Leslie Ash responded, uh, this is not the purpose of the foundation, so uh, we can't really send you money that way. But then uh, every so often I'd get a $2,000 check from Jim with a note saying, thinking of you. You know, and, uh, which, which was terrific. So he was an influence. Uh, Allie Lou Curtin, I can't tell you how important she is to, to my life. And again, the people that she introduced me to, uh, it goes on exponentially at this point. Richard Bradshaw, Nancy Staub, um, Penny Francis in England, uh, Margarita Nicolescu from, uh, from uh, Romania and France. These are all people who have been shepherds for me um, i've been open with them i've discussed my ideas with them they have uh, acknowledged what i did um, they've criticized what i've done and let, let me say critic critiqued what i've done um, not not, not uh, I, don't, I can't remember any negative oh you shouldn't have done that but uh you know maybe do this a little differently this way um, but I really think that the two people who were most important in my career were Albrecht Roser and Margot Rose. They both saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. My, my intention was to be a performer fabricator. I love going on the road. Um, uh, it's, there's just something special about that for me, touring. But they kept finding reasons I needed to do this over here. Yeah, keep keep doing your performing, but try this also. I need your help here. Or could you do this for me? And they are the ones who guided me to what I'm doing today. You know, Margo specifically with the O'Neill Center, but Albrecht, um, <laughs> the, he, Ingrid, and I uh, did a tour of Hong Kong, Guangzhou, and tai, Taipei. Uh, the idea was um, it, it, he, 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 I had alumni in Taiwan. Albert had worked with them as well. We were invited to Taiwan. When they heard we were coming there, then a friend in, in Hong Kong said, oh, I need you in Hong Kong and Guangzhou as well. And so we went down to do performances, uh, Albert do performances, and for all of us to lead workshops. And we were in Guangzhou. Uh, Albert was working with scarf marionettes. And he was very frustrated that the puppeteers, the Chinese puppeteers, just weren't getting it. And so I said, can I try something, Albrecht? And I stepped in. And having worked in China prior to that, I understood a process for teaching in China and went through that process. And I remember afterwards, Albrecht looking at me and saying, teaching is your art. And I said, OK, I accept that from you. And that means a whole lot to me coming from you. So, oh gosh, that derailment. That was just a really beautiful uh, story. And I don't remember the question I was going to ask. <laughs> That's really lovely. And I, I think 
um, having spoken to a couple people, um, in particular Austin Costello, in preparation for, for talking with you today, um, I know that you've created those same experiences for people who have uh, come after and um, who are, you know, will be the next generation of, of people. And it's this wonderful lineage that's happened um, that um, I think you've had a huge part in, which is just it's so lovely. Um, that we're talking about Albrecht. Um, I'm wondering if you could share, because um, we've both benefited of, of hearing the story before, but would love to hear, um, have it recorded for posterity, um, your experience of the Rockaburton putty versus the, the Roser putty. <laughs> uh, the, the, yeah, Al the Roser putty. <laughs> Just, oh, such sure. a great story. <laughs> sure. Well, it, it, it comes down to the fact that um, when Albrecht taught us um, uh, uh, paper sculpture in uh, 77, uh, a material called Celastic was readily available. Celastic was originally used in the shoe industry to make the toes of shoes hard. And then the theater um, found it. Uh, price went up exponentially, of course. And uh, they. it was perfect for paper sculpture because, as I mentioned earlier, with the paper sculpture, you cut the, the, the original sculpture apart. You have a flat pattern. You could actually cut the celastic to that flat pattern. The horrible thing about celastic was that you had to dip it into acetone to activate it. And acetone is a deadly chemical. Um, we would dip it into the acetone and just lay it over the model and it would harden uh, as the acetone gave off. Celastic being a felt embedded with the plastic colloid and um, the acetone melted the plastic and then as it gave off it, the plastic hardened. After we were working on this for a couple of years, uh, it, it was actually pro probably another 10, 15 years that we were still doing it that way. Uh, they stopped making Celastic in the company in Germany where they were making it. I was just going into a, a major production of Christmas Carol where I needed to make 50 masks and intended to use Celastic. I actually called the company and said, you know, how dare you start considering my health? And they said, well, it's not about your health. It's the fact that it's such a small part of our business and we have to work with nitrocellulose in the manufacture of it, which is an explosive. And we decided not to risk our buildings. Yeah, so, okay, economy. Or your insurance premiums, yeah. Right, I, economy, I can't fight that. That doesn't help me make 50 masks. <laughs> right. <laughs> Tell me something I want to hear. So um, uh, we sort of thought that paper sculpture was dead because we needed that to harden the actual thing unless we wanted to leave it in paper, which was ridiculous. It happened that summer, Albrecht was coming over, and we talked about it. We said, let's, let's find something new. And so we started working with sawdust and ground paper and a couple of different glues, uh, wood glue and um, uh, a metal and cellulose wallpaper paste. And we found things that were starting to, to work. Uh, we were able to make a nice putty. And the idea we figured was instead of putting it onto the surface like Celastic would be done, we'd put it on the inside. Problem is we're working with paper and we've just made a wet putty. By the time the putty hardens, it, the moisture would have gone into the paper. It would have warped. So we started looking for a moisture blocker. And um, I came home uh, one day, and Albrecht's in my workshop in the basement. He goes, I found it. I found it. And he has a tube of Duco cement, and he's putting it on on the inside of the, the paper sculpture. And he was right. The Duco served as a moisture barrier. But I said, you know, Albrecht, we've been forced to move away from acetone do you miss it i mean is this why you're working with duco cement so close to your nose <laughs> so we uh, said okay that's not the right solution um and after a little while i said let me try something and i took some wood glue and put it onto a brush and wiped it away so it was pretty dry and just sort of spread it onto the inside of the the cardboard or the the oak tag I did this three times. So basically the glue is almost dry as it comes off the brush. But by doing it three times, I got the entire surface uh, covered and I had set up a moisture barrier that I could let lay the wet putty onto the inside. So we had found our, our method. We were pretty convinced that this was a good idea and the heads, although the surface is still the oak tag, they're as hard as could be. Uh, so, um, 
that's where it started. Then Albrecht would come, or uh, yeah, Albrecht would come over and uh, say, "I've found a different way of cutting the paper." So we would add that into the into the formula, and then I would say, "You know." I'm going to use the sawdust from the sander instead of the bandsaw, and I get a finer texture, and I can actually get a, a putty that's malleable. It went back and forth like that, and we, we used to joke, okay, now it's Rocco Burton putty. Uh, now it's Roser putty again. Now it's Rocco Burton putty. <laughs> well, the, the last element to be added to the process, um, I was doing my laundry, and I was thinking I had to mix up a batch of putty, and I was thinking about the fact that what we were trying to do was to get fibers that would lay across each other, causing an internal structure. And, you know, the sawdust would do that. The paper uh, pulp would do that. And as I was cleaning the, um, the lint out of the dryer, I took it and said, oh, my God, that's fiber. And so I did an experiment. And it took a little while. But at first, I, I added it to the putty, and it was like lumps. But I've since figured out how to emulsify the the three elements together so that there's lots of fibers sort of floating around in a bucket of water and then i slush it off and um add it together and what we ha end up with is a putty that if you put on like a 16th of an inch it's hard to cut it with a knife you know a sharp knife right so um it it, it remains rocco burton putty <laughs> <laughs> That's that's great, and I, I've heard that story a couple of times. I've never thought of asking uh, what was the time period that that took to figure out from finding out that um, you couldn't do the Christmas Carol uh, with with Celastic until you finally of, of, officially made it Rocker Burton Buddy. Uh, probably about four years. Okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Um, and that's just that so speaks to like the different kinds of things that puppeteers have to deal with in finding new new materials. I mean. We're, you're going through it right now with Antron fleece in some ways. Every, just, every, everyone is, yeah. yeah. They stopped. Uh, well, like they went through it a couple of years ago. First, where they stopped manufacturing the one kind with the 16 ounce, and now they only had the 12 ounce. Now the 12 ounce doesn't. They're not really making it anymore. So you know, luckily, you know, Puppet Belt is trying to create something new, and we're going to have them on the podcast soon and, and talk all about that because they're coming up with some pretty cool different stuff. And most people don't like change, but you know what? Changes are coming, so right. you got to roll with the punches. you got to make your own Rock of Burton putty sometimes. Right. And talk to people about plastic wood. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. You know, one more thing, uh, you know, I know, I, I think a lot of people will look back on this, people who will be hopefully, you know, discovering UConn as, uh, in the program mm -hmm. and maybe using it as a resource to get ideas for, uh, you know, how to hopefully submit something. And... um I know we talked about already, you mentioned that you look for creativity, but, uh, you know, on one side, you know, that that's the best piece of advice you could give someone, but on the end of someone applying, it's probably also a little bit of a frustrating, you know, type of advice because it's like, I feel like the thing that people have the most trouble um, doing sometimes is, is expressing their creativity. And do you have any advice on to maybe people who might be applying or want to apply in the future to the program to help show their best self? Mm -hmm. yeah, and um, their, their authentic self. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'd, I guess I relate this to um, do, doing classroom workshops for first and second graders that um, I – when when I, I I don't get to do these anymore because of where I am, but uh, I used to enjoy doing them, and I would go in with no preconceived ideas of what the skills of the people in front of me, the kids in front of me, were, and would teach them shadow theater and walk around the classroom and talk to them, and the number of times that a teacher would come to me and say, "How did you get him to behave? He never behaves in class," you know, and I said, "Well, I didn't know that." And so I just sort of paid attention to who he was and asked him questions and guided him according to what I was seeing. Um, so I think at a young age, we're discovering what our creativity is. Uh, later in life, when you're in high school, what is it that makes you feel good? What, what is it that you can't, that you have a passion to do? That, that's what's leading you into your creativity. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that people can create cre a, a creative self to come and audition for us. What I'm looking for is how are you expressing yourself? You know, do you play trombone? 
play trombone for me. You know, show me what you want. Uh, um, we, we had a, a gentleman a couple of years ago who came in and played sax uh, for us. And we were blown away by it and then said, you know, let's try the, the improvised section of the audition and see how you make your sax speak to us through visual elements. And he did it. Uh, so, um, you know, the creativity we're looking for, we can't create. Um, I don't think that people can can say, oh, click, uh, I need to go be creative. Yeah. Show us what you are doing to, yeah. to express yourself. That's yeah, I feel like the, the biggest uh, hiccup that people tend to make is doing what they think you want to see. You know, yeah. I'm sure that's something you see a lot of people probably wonder. Some, I'm sure some people sit there thinking, oh, I'm not good enough of a puppeteer to, to, to apply to this, you know. And, um, and like you said, that's not necessarily what you're looking for. You're looking to cultivate a puppeteer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and even like you said, if maybe if you are too good, maybe the program is not right for you because you've already found yourself as an artist. So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, there was something else. I, know, I should have turned that into a question somehow. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of put a button on it. I was yeah. like, oh, boy. Well, I, I guess you yeah. know, one, one thing that I, 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 I wanted to bring up, too, because um, I was very close to having an opportunity to, to go to, to UConn and go to the program, which is one thing that I go back and forth on all the time is, is you know, if I did, I make the right decision. And I knew at the time I kind of had made the only decision uh, I, I thought I really, I, I should have made because I was in a pickle to where I was going to be an, a, a, an art teacher, going to be starting to be an art teacher, my undergrad. And I had three years to get, uh, or no, you have five years in New York state to get uh, a master's degree and three years of teaching experience. And I didn't have a teaching job yet. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to, do, I'm going to try to do something that I think is just going to be fun, you yep. know? Yep. And, and, and I remember we talked to you, I, I got to go down there and, and do a tour. And the second I walked into that workshop, I was just like, Oh my gosh, like this is my people. Like this is where I would love to be here. Just walking into that workshop. I recommend to anybody if they're ever in town in, in, in Connecticut to be able to stop in as long as they have permission to be there, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it will, it's a beautiful it, complex. It is breathtaking. Yeah. And I was like, oh, and that's where I met Penny Benson for the first time. And, um, you know, uh, I ended up getting that same summer where I would have gone in the September or August, uh, getting my first teaching job, which I had to get that experience uh, for that. So uh, I always look back and wonder if, uh, you know, had had I not gotten that job, uh, what an awesome experience I, I'm sure I would have had. Well, look at what you're doing, though. You know, you, you, you've continued on a path that you had a passion for. Uh, you were still working in puppetry. Um, it, hooray that we gave you some inspiration. But, um, again, it, we're not for everybody. Yeah. And yeah. you know what, though? I think that's a perfect example, too. Whereas, uh, you know, maybe that was all I needed was just yeah. to, to meet you. And meet some people there and see that there is other people doing this. Right. You know, right. And that's one the, thing. The I, I affirmation. Would, yeah, the yeah. affirmation. You know, and I think that is one thing I would love to have us do. Maybe me and Cam come down and do a visit. We'd love to do like a, a video tour or something with you. Sure. Maybe another little sit down interview. That'd be uh, great. I think that'd be really awesome to do at some point. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, it's one of the reasons I'm so happy that the the National Puppetry Conference exists, uh, because it is the opportunity for people to get together and and find their tribe. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, I mean, many of the Yukon students go to that every year. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as the Yukon summer camp, but it's not. It, it's yeah. it's an international event that they get to participate in. Uh, so, yeah, I'm so happy about that. Yeah. You know, and especially for people where maybe going back to school to get a whole degree is too much of a life change to do something sure. like that. Whereas something going to the uh, um, the O'Neill is, is the perfect uh, it's kind of mini uh, lesson to do that. Sure. And, you know, s something else that we have happening at this point, uh, we do have online courses for graduates. Uh, we have an online graduate certificate. And Paul Spirito, um, our, our um, technical supervisor for the Puppet Arts Program, one of our alumni, is the director of the online program. And we're actually looking at this right now. Currently, it is four courses that you need to take in order to earn the certificate. At first, when they said, we want you to teach puppetry online, we went, uh-huh, sure. <laughs> <clears throat> but we thought about it, and we've been running it now for, I guess, eight years. And uh, we're teaching hand puppetry. Uh, Fergus Walsh, one of our alumni, is teaching that. 
uh, Shadow Theater, and Penny Benson, who you just mentioned, teaches that. Um, Paul Spirito is teaching materials techniques. We're online. He's having people do sculpting and mold making and casting. And then, um, oh dear, not not. Uh, we we have a, a, um, a theater his, or a puppet history course that John Bell has designed. Um, we we are we are actually looking at changing the format of this. Um, Paul had the idea that you know we we have a steady steady number of students taking the classes and people can take uh, the, the online classes and then apply to become a student physically at UConn and finish out a degree. But Paul has an idea that it might be smarter to do short, short courses that are not related to a, a degree or a certificate that anybody can sign up to take. So stick with us. Probably in about six months, we'll know whether or not we can do that. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. I'm sure people would love to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that, that would broaden our, our, our faculty. Uh, you know, we, um, I could have Gisela Drescher from Munich teach a, a wood carving class. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was just mentioning, some people might not need the credits or something. Yeah. They'd love to yeah. take the, the course. The knowledge. Yeah. Right. The knowledge. Wow. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Beautiful. Um, one other question before, before we start wrapping up, because, you know, we could be talking with you for, for days and days about all this <laughs> stuff, and we'd, lo we'd love to have you back on and, and all that such but um you you've seen a lot of trends in puppetry over over your time and certainly in studying the history of it um what what do you kind of see as some of the future of um of puppet arts and and how how the art form will continue to adapt and and just move forward as as we go along do you have any insight into that i'm sure you do <laughs> yeah. well you know what what new digital device came out today uh you know, we're, 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 we are an art form that absorbs what's available to us. And, and um, so that, that's going to keep us in a flow of expression. Uh, it's something that I deal with as I'm, I'm planning classes, you know, materials techniques. There are so many wonderful materials out there right now uh, put out by Smooth On and Reynolds. And as I come up to teaching materials, techniques, I say, I say to myself, okay, which one of these hundreds of possibilities do I need to teach? And it all boils down to, you need to know how to sculpt, you need to know how to make a mold. So I'm still teaching, you know, oil-based clay sculpture and plaster mold making. If you can make a plaster mold, you can make a silicone mold, you can make a polyurethane mold. Uh, you can do a cast, if you read the instructions, of course, it's not the same processes, but the basic ideas, the foundations are the same. So that is what I'm doing in the materials class. Um, we, we start with the, the clay sculpture, make the mold, do a neoprene cast. Okay, so slush molding you learn. We then move on to subtractive sculpture where we take a piece of styrofoam and design a head, do a projection so you have front and profile, cut it out, carve it. Once you've done that, we move on to wood. And people go, wood? I said, yeah, you know, wood, learning how to carve wood is still very valuable. And the fact is, if you know how to carve styrofoam, you can carve wood. It's just the, the tools are a little sharper. So you need yeah. to be a little more careful. Um, so where are we going in the future? It, it, it comes down to what can you guys, the, my students, what can you add to what we're doing? I mean, projection is very much part of what we're doing now. Um, uh, the use of digital media. It, it comes down to what are the tools available to us to express what we already have been doing. You know, how can we take it further? Uh, Jim Henson, of course, took advantage of television medium. A lot of people are taking advantage now of digital internet medium. Uh, what's the next device? Um, that's where we'll head. Yeah, yeah. It kind of almost reminds me in the same way, like they'll, they'll always, we'll always need like a plumber in some way. There's certain types of uh, building that will kind of always be there. But one little uh, thing that I'd, I'd ask you about, has uh, 3D printing become much of a element in what you guys do? Yes, um, we don't have a 3D print. Well, we have a small one uh, in our building. Uh, it is something that the students are now looking at. Um, uh, we actually have someone uh, who is, I'm going to say, is part of our program, Kevin Marinelli, who is a computer uh, uh, 
guy uh, working on a computer doctorate. And he had an interest in puppets, and I was introduced to him. Uh, first thing he showed me was a, a digital glove that he had that he could move things off in the distance by moving his fingers and his hand. And the first time I met him, I said, do you want me to call Brian Henson? He goes, well, I need to learn more about this. So he's several years later, he's still around with us. Um, he has helped us in so many ways that I've actually given him a desk in our workshop. You know, you have a workbench here. Come influence us. Uh, yeah. Where where he's leading us, um, he has knowledge that we don't have, but he also works with the math department, and the math department is setting up models of shapes that they use for demonstrating something. I'm not sure what. Um, and he showed me the shapes the other day, and he said, and this was printed, this was digitally printed. I said, okay, fine, uh, 3D printed. And he then said it took them 24 hours to print this one. He has hired one of my undergraduate students to make a silicone mold of this and show them that they can get a dozen of these things poured yeah. in a 24-hour period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, rather than waiting two Move days to print yeah, one. Right, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So we're, we're, he, he's, he's influencing us that way. Um, you know, there are a number of people working on uh, joints, uh, ball joints, and um, other elements for puppetry. Paul Spirito himself has, has done some uh, uh, th uh, 3D printing. Caleb Martinez, uh, when he did his hand puppet MFA project of Macbeth uh, that he called El Beto, um, we, we took 360 photos of his head, put him into the computer. Um, he found the 3D printing engineering club, showed it to them. They said, oh, we can print that. So they printed out his head in miniature. And then he went into a program and re-sculpted his own face. So all the hand puppets in his show are actually his head in different mm. shapes. Oh, cool. oh, that's cool. That's, that's awesome. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, the the things you could do is just that's incredible and yeah, and then speaks to the ingenuity of of the program and yeah, absolutely. and the approach. You know, there's there's one more thing I wanted yeah. to bring up too cuz one thing I that I always loved about you and your personality and you know, he, hearing you talk at the O'Neill and whatnot is how much of a, you know, um how much a truest and maybe a stickler you are to like to puppet history and you know, and trying mm. to make sure people are um, you know, trying to to learn correctly, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, and 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 I, in a way, I'm like that with some things as well. Even when people call Antron fleece, Antron fleece, that's not really what it is. It, it's nylon fleece. It just it th certain things in the industries tend to get nicknames. You know, and one th one thing you hear often, I've heard you um, um, teach people about is sometimes people call something like. Um, uh, Bunraku style puppetry, and you're like, no, that's not Bunraku style puppetry. That's tabletop puppetry that you're doing. You know, Bunraku has a has a cultural element to it that that is not part of what this is doing. And um, I guess what I would ask in that is, what do you think is the best way for people who are at home on their own to learn like the best type of um, puppet history and different types of puppetry on their own? <laughs> um. Talking to people, reading, um, you know, the, the books that I would recommend instantly would be Paul McFarlane's Puppet Theater in America, which has been out of print since 1968. But I am teaching a class in trends in contemporary American puppetry right now. And I said to the students, this book is required. Find it. And they all have a copy of it now. They all have yeah. a copy. Um, it's, it's a remarkable history that this man put together, and he wrote it in the 40s. Uh, it was added to by his, his wife, Marjorie Batchelder, uh, in the 60s. It's, it's a really good history of puppetry in this hemisphere, not just the colonial days, but pre-Columbian days as well. Another wonderful book is John Bell's uh, American Puppet Modernism. Uh, this book is a number of essays that relate very closely to to, to McFarland's book uh, and supplement it in really rich ways. So that those those would be the two books I point to immediately, but also talking to your seniors, you know, who 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 went before you? What do you know of them? Uh, you know, my trends class is really based on I want my students to know who they are and where they fit in. 
Um, some of my richest times have been listening to tapes that Margot had made about her career with Rufus, where they built a show and got in a car without a booking and headed out to do sh shows. And they'd go into a town and basically beat the drum and do a show. And after the show, they'd stop along the road and pick berries so they had something to eat. And, you know, he hearing that type of stuff, I go, you know, they did it. I can make it. You know, the, the, it gives me courage. And there's some marvelous people have gone before us, you know, pay attention to them. I, I'm currently listening to the, uh, the book, make art, make money. Um, oh yeah. Okay. On Jim Henson's, uh, business yeah. model. That was just recommended to me yesterday by someone that one got by me. I don't know how I didn't hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a really, really good book. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm listening to it for the second time this week. It was so good. I said, I'm just going to listen to it again. Uh, re really uh, the, the perspective of, how Jim did things, but also it's a great deal of his philosophy uh, that, you know, we, we lost a great man in 1990, but we still have so much from him. That's beautiful. I would like to mention that I'm not the only teacher in the puppet oh, arts yes. program. Okay. Um, in 2007, uh, uh, John Bell came on as director of the Ballard Institute Museum of Puppetry. And uh, seven, several years later, John became a professor within dramatic arts. So John is teaching every semester, as well as running the Ballard Institute. And this semester, we were gifted with a gentleman named Matthew Cohen, uh, who has been teaching at Royal Holloway in London. Uh, he is a respected international scholar uh, on uh, Wayang, the Wayang of Indonesia and basically just a really smart practitioner. Uh, so we're very happy to have him as part of us. So he is um, just starting this semester and uh, the, the program is changing again, is what I'm trying to say. That's great. Yeah, and we'll definitely in all the show notes and materials include links to learn more about the program and, and the people who are, are a part of it. Good. Uh, definitely. Um, so as we begin to wrap up, uh, as you know, the name of the show is Puppet Tears, and uh, we love to ask people, and I'm sure you have <laughs> millions and millions of them, but a, a good fun story of a time uh, when you were working on a project where things weren't going well, uh, made you want to pull your hair out at the time, but looking back now, you could kind of laugh about it and, and share a good puppeteer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness me. Uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to talk about anything practical because nothing's coming to, to mind at, at this point. You know, in, in terms of my process of fabricating and creating a show, um, there, there are lots of failures, uh, but they are always, uh, you know, springboards for the next level of, of creation. Um, I think the thing that brings tears to my eyes <laughs> Are, are the, the losses of people uh, as time goes on. And I guess the most, the most recent poignant one um, for me was um, when we were working on the project for the Boston Pops, uh, I was in constant communication with Allie Lou Curtin and telling her about what we were doing and sharing with her. And she was very excited and she was looking forward to coming down to Symphony Hall to see the show. And it happened that she had fallen the week that we were going to perform with them and ended up in the hospital. The morning that we were doing the, the matinee and evening show Saturday, um, I called her daughter Libby and asked if they were going to come to the show. And that's when I realized that, uh, that Allie Lou was under care. And I asked if, um, if it would be appropriate for me to come to the hospital and at least show her the, the Arthur Fiedler puppet, which I'd been telling her about. And Libby said, you could come, but she's not really aware of people around her right now. Um, you could hold her hand, but um, it, it, probably bringing the puppet doesn't make any sense. And before I could get in the car uh, or in, in the, the cab to go, I got a message that Allie Lou had passed. And uh, I turned to the students and let them know that Allie Lou would not be coming uh, because she had just passed away. 
and my Romanian student looked at me and said, you know what? She figured out how to get here by herself. And so we, um, that, those performances that they, uh, Keith Lockhart dedicated to Ellie Lou Curtin. So and it was, um, yeah, losses. You know, the people who have been such a big influence on your life and continue to be, but you know, you can't make that phone call again. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Um, well, it's thank you story. for sharing that. Yeah, it, it really is. And as were so many of the things you shared and um, that we just, we feel privileged that you let us call you up today and we were able to, to pick your brain and hear some of these stories and um, certainly won't be the last time. So, um, uh, do, well, before we wrap up, it, are, uh, are, how can people get in touch with uh, either with you or with the Yukon program to learn more about the, the work that you're doing? Sure. Um, if you want to use the old method of a telephone, uh, you could call 860-486-4568. Uh, that's in our administration office, and uh, I have a graduate student who, who goes in there several times a week. Um, you can also write to us via email at puppetarts, uh, P-U-P-P-E-T-A-R-T-S, at yukon, U-C-O-N-N dot E-D-U. That's the Perfect. best way to reach us. Great. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, we'll, we'll include that along with all the other information. Um, so, well, Bart Rockerburton, thank you so much for joining us on Puppeteers. It's been so great to, to talk with you and love to have you back. Just just ask. You got it. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks a lot, Bart.